Video games come in all sorts of packages. You got your first person shooters. Missile alarm ram. Missile alarm ram. MMOs. Fuck! Fighting games. It's like I give people wings! Don't I give people wings this mother- But I want a challenge. One that takes skill, but if I get lucky, I get to have some fun. Introducing roguelikes. Roguelikes are games that specialize in randomized playthroughs. The special thing about these though is that if you die, you lose everything. Which I can get how this turns off a lot of people, but I love that aspect as it keeps the gameplay fresh. The term roguelike comes from the 1980 Rogue. Rogue was a dungeon crawler with procedurally generated levels that generated enemies and loot. It's thanks to this that we got so many classics today, and even a subgenre within the roguelike category. Roguelites. But we're not here to discuss the history of roguelikes. We're here to talk about one of my favorites in the genre. One Step from Eden. Now, some of you may have played it, or heard about it, but to those who haven't, it's fucking good. It's not really a story game. There are hints to one, but it's mostly gameplay. And let's be honest, that's what you're here for. Without further ado, let's begin to the ascent into Eden. One Step for Eden basically takes place in the distant future, where everything is just chaos. After a post-war, there is only one safe place left on the planet, and that's Eden. Eden's origins are unknown, but to outsiders, it's their only hope left. It is your goal to reach Eden by any means necessary, whether that being extremely caring or brutal. One Step from Eden's gameplay takes heavy inspiration from Mega Man's Battle Network, and its best summarized is this. Critical thinking, brain dead spam, and high reflexes within the span of two seconds. What? Yeah, it, it's, it's a little, uh, it's a little hectic. Your main weapon will be these cards, and these cards are your spells. Each spell is different, and whether it's utility, defense, or offense, these cards are your bread and butter. Well, depending on your character. That's right, there are other characters you can play, and just like other roguelikes, you need to work for them. Each character is very different and unique, and probably going to be very hard to get used to at the beginning, but, don't worry, because I also had the same experience. When I unlocked them, I just stuck to the original for a long time, but eventually I decided to try out the others and found their strengths. And some of them are broken to play. For the gameplay, you start off on a 4x8 rectangle that allows you to move 4 spaces vertically and horizontally. You cannot move diagonally, and you cannot go to your opponent's area. The enemy, your spells, and weapons have two attack patterns. One that targets a square, and one that attacks a row. There are spells that aren't limited to this, like targeting the enemy itself, but still mostly targeting the area they're at. You also have mana, which corresponds to whatever spell you're going to use, as each spell costs a different amount of mana. You start off with no mana in the beginning of a fight, and mana will regen throughout the battle, and will cap depending on the amount of mana gems you have. There are also ways to speed it up, and also increase the cap size of it. Now, what happens if you run out of cards? Well, you gotta shuffle which leaves you with no spells for a couple of seconds. You can also shuffle manually if you don't like the current spells in your two slots, but once again, leaves you open for a bit. Now here's where it can get difficult depending on the type of person playing. You have to watch both the enemy's movement to either avoid or attack them, and keep track of what spells you're currently using, because you only have two in your slots. Do you kind of get why I said it's either a game where you're constantly thinking of your next move, or just spamming whatever two choices you have right now? You're probably going to pick the latter option if you've just started playing, not even mentioning the special events that can happen, like hostages can appear on the enemy side, which can give you rewards if they live, but also have to try not to let the enemy hit them, and you also have to try not to kill them as well. It all sounds really challenging, and, and it is, to be fair, but these are the type of games where you're supposed to get your ass kicked. With failure comes learning, and experiencing growth in these types of games is so rewarding because you go from this shitter who can't even get past the first level to a demigod that can kill something by looking at it. Now, after you clear the first zone, you'll be given an artifact. Artifacts are the items that help you get stronger or help you live. And these have an insane amount of variety. 
There are artifacts that can incentivize speedrunning, artifacts that give you more mana gems, and even artifacts that let you start out with full mana at the start of a fight, so you don't have to wait for it to build up. Artifacts are basically just the items you get in roguelikes that help you become stronger. You also have the option to skip them, in case you don't like the hand that's been given to you. What happens after is the card selection, where you're given three spells to pick from. Pay attention to each card logo at the bottom of these, as these are focuses. Focuses are what help you get to the build that you want. These focuses are different type of cards that give you increased chance of whatever type of card you pick. If I pick an anima card, I'll be more likely to get an anima card in my next card selection. Though, to be honest, it still feels like cards are given to you randomly, so don't just go for one focus. There are 10 focuses, and these can get very hard to get used to. If you're just starting off, then I recommend picking whatever looks good. Like I said before, you can also skip these cards in case you want a certain type of deck. Not to mention, there's also a leveling system in this game. And to sum it up, after you die or complete the game, most likely die, you level up and unlock more artifacts and spells to add to your arsenal. The max level is 50, and the higher your level is, the more rare cards get added. Like the Calamity cards, which are the most rare and broken cards in the game. By the way, should I talk about each focus? Fuck it, lightning round. You know what, we're just gonna, we're just gonna go into it. Anima is elemental based with fire, ice, and thunder spells. They only consist of damage spells and are very simple to use. Probably the easiest focus to use of all of them. Convergence relies on easy ways to obtain mana, money, and increase your spell power. You also have Trinity cards, and Trinity is basically the uh, big brain spell enhancer that allows certain spells to have additional effects. In short, use a Trinity card two times, and then on the third use, something special happens. This can go from shooting a tiny orb to creating this giant sword that does a shit ton of damage. Double lift manipulates the cards and deck. It requires quick thinking, so if you're not the type to like think on your feet, then I'd recommend staying away from this one. Some of these cards also have Trinity and Jam. What is Jam? Jam can either be a complete nuisance or a game changer. Jam is, as it says in the name, jams your deck for a moment. It makes you unable to move and also costs 2 mana. If you do use a jam, it will go away forever, however, if you use the same card again that created the jam, it'll just, you know, keep on cycling over and over. Jam cards are the high risk, high reward spells. They either do a lot of damage, cost no mana, or do both. Which is honestly such a snake way to lead you to pick the card, cause you look at it and you're like, damn, this seems too good to be true. And guess what? You're right. Especially if you get two jams in both slots, and you have to decide whether to shuffle or use them. Don't worry though, because there is a solution to this, and it relies on RN Jesus himself. Remember when I talked about artifacts? Well, some have the ability to make jams go from annoying to PLEASE GOD GIVE ME MORE. Having trouble with jams anchoring you? No problem. Think they cost too much mana? Here you go. Wanna make them actually useful? Right here. And the holy trinity is getting all of them in one run. If this happens, it is mandatory to become a jam only run. It's not a choice, it's the law. Moving on, we have Glimmer, which is just a uh, light and beam spells, you know, woo, very simple and has fairly good damage spells. Not that much to it, to be honest. Hearth is very confusing as it has three attributes that come with it. Root, Flow, and Tile Destruction. Root is what it implies, it just roots the enemy for a moment, but be careful as they can still attack. Tile Destruction just breaks a tile or square, and you can basically use this to trap enemies and easily stomp them. And Flow! Flow. I hate Flow. Flow can be gained by certain spells and artifacts. Whenever a spell is casted, you actually lose one flow. I say one flow, as they can be stacked. And basically, there will be cards that have bonus effects based on the amount of flow you have. Very hard to use and keep track of, and pretty much useless if you're a card hoarder, so if you want to use flow, get a bunch of upgrades and get flow on your cards. And if you're wondering why I sound a little bit different, is because this is actually editing me, and I didn't like the way I said all this stuff. Hex 1 are the building spells that require turrets or walls. Surprisingly, this also requires a lot of thinking to use, and they're kind of trash to be honest. We'll, we'll get back to this later. Kinzies, kin, kinzie, kinzies are spells that rely on mobility and can move targets. Misery is the poison, pain, and self-healing cards. 
They also have some spells that apply fragile, which basically just boosts your damage. Phalanx gives you shields and ways to protect yourself. Pretty simple. And finally, Slash Vic. Slash Vic has spells that associate with blades and swords. They also have these neat little things called kunais, and they're just jams, but better in every way. Like, literally, every way. There's also a specific character that uses kunais, so we'll be in more detail with kunais a lot later. Okay, we're done with all that, and now we can move on to the map. After finishing the first battle, you'll be able to look at the map of the world you're in. The map is one of the most important things to get used to. Why? Because this is how you plan everything. The map helps you plan out where to travel, what route to take, and what works best for you. You'll be given three paths to go through, and some paths lead to other paths, while other times you're only allowed to go through one. In the paths are seven events that can appear on the map. The first one, Battle, is just your average brawl. Distress is where you'll be tasked with saving hostages, like I said earlier. This includes saving them from turrets and explosive crystals. The hostage that has been saved can give you either health, artifact, or money depending on their clothing. Hazard is where shit goes down, and are probably the most chaotic places on the map. Things like volcanoes can appear, nukes that will have a timer until they reach the ground, and they will do a lot of damage if that hits by the way. Also, a lot of the hard enemies can be found here as well, so it's best to avoid these. The camp is where you'll be able to get some health back, and you also have the choice to kill a rabbit. The rabbit increases luck, but also makes enemies more difficult. You can also stack this with other campfires in other worlds, meaning you'll be getting more luck, but also harder opponents as well. The shop is the shop. It's where you spend your money on the shopkeeper. You can buy upgrades and removals, as well as artifacts and spells. I'm assuming you know what upgrades and removals mean. Low on money? No worries. Just a generous donation of your blood, and you'll be all good. That's what I would say, but you don't even get that much. You can also activate these packs that give you certain boosts, but also will put you at a disadvantage for a certain number of fights. Very risky, but if you're good at the game, it might be worth it in the long run. I'd also highly recommend not testing your newly bought spells in her zone. Trust me, you'll regret it. If you played Enter the Gungeon, then you'll, you'll especially know this. Treasure is where you can get some artifacts and money very easily. The chests will try their best not to be opened by the way, so be ready when you go there. These chests can also appear in battle sometimes as well. And then mini bosses. And this, these are where the boys become the slightly bigger boys. That sounds wrong, why did I, why, why did I, write, why did I write that? You'll basically just fight a bunch of strong enemies and get an artifact and a whole bunch of XP after. It's important to carefully plan ahead, as if you go towards a mini boss, you might bite off more than you can chew. For example, you can go to a mini boss zone, but take a lot of damage from that, and now you're low on health, and there aren't any more campfires in your path. This is especially important because at the end of each world is where your real test will begin. At the end of each world is a boss level, and these guys, they're the reason why the gameplay is nice. Some are going to be easier than others, of course, but even the weakest ones, I'd say, are pretty damn difficult. Each boss has their own theme and appears depending on the level. By the way, the music in this game is just... It's so good. Each boss is also extremely fun to fight against. Well, almost every boss. The bosses themselves also scale with difficulty with every two worlds. The highest being tier 7. And Jesus Christ, tier 4 and above bosses are rough. Like, they will kick your ass. Not only are they faster and have a shit ton of health, they're also given new moves or upgrades to their previous moves. After beating a boss, you're given the option to either spare them or kill them. If you kill them, you get artifacts and this really sad tone plays that basically screams, Wow, you're a horrible person. If you spare them though, they will drop 400 health in case you need it, and also assist you at the start of other fights or other zones. If you manage to be a world at full health, then the next one will have the dark red path. If you decide to go down this path, you will be forced to stay on it no matter what. The dark path not only buffs every enemy, but also chests try to kill you now. Also, the shopkeeper now only accepts blood. 
so watch out. Each boss you beat at tier 3 and above is also unlocked as a character. Oh yeah, the characters are actually the bosses. Forgot to mention that. Speaking of, let's talk about them and my personal opinion on each one. To explain in simple terms, unlocking the characters is the equivalent to that meme, the boss when you fight them versus the boss when you unlock them as a character. Nevertheless, they're great. I love some of them. Most of them. I love most of them. I don't really know how to talk about the characters and their boss fights, though since their boss fights are essentially roided up versions of themselves, I think it'd be a good idea to just talk about the characters and their kits while also talking about the main aspects of their boss fights. If you plan on playing this game and also don't want to see the boss's main abilities, then I'd recommend listening to me explain the characters and then skipping over to the next character when I'm about to talk about the bosses. Now if you don't want the characters spoiled, then just buy the game. Trust me, I would not make this long ass video if it wasn't good. And it was mostly composed by one guy. So please, give him some support. Now, let's jump right into the character. I summon what Pot of Greed to draw three additional cards from my deck! Saffron is a young researcher at the age of 19. She's 5'6 and extremely smart. By the way, I got most of my info about the characters from the wiki, so believe what you want. <laughs> She also might be one of the reasons why there was a giant war, as she created the Calamity cards, and they got stolen and might have been used as war weapons. What the dog do? Thanks, Saffron. Now her goal is to get those powerful spells back and retreat into the safety of Eden. Each character has a separate kit from the original, which vastly changes their playstyle. Her first kit is simple and easy to play, however, can get a little boring. You have a self revive as your starting artifact in case you make too many mistakes and a pea shooter that's basically just there for chip damage. The main aspect of this kit is basically just to get you used to things. And after getting the next one, you'll probably just leave this one in dust. Chrono, their second kit, is like that slight upgrade from their basic kit, but just way better in every way. Her weapon now just slows down time for two seconds. Yes, she slows down time. And the artifact that she starts with now allows her to heal at the start of every battle depending on how many cards you have in your deck. Time slow is great for spamming spells and dodging attacks, and since your speed isn't slowed down when using it, it allows you to easily get away from some attacks you're having trouble with. Honestly, I think this variant is easier than the first. Sure, a self revive is good, but time slow can easily get past the attacks that just killed you. She is also undeniably the best deck build in the game, as her kit doesn't really interfere with anything she builds. If you don't like her starter spells, you can just remove them from the shopkeeper, and then go on and make whatever the hell you want. She also has a third kit, and it's the glass cannon variant. You have one spell that does a lot of damage, but it's also pretty slow. So to be honest, it probably requires the most amount of skill to use out of all of her kits. You also have almost no health, but hey, you've been given an artifact that works well with that. A way to get more health. You just have to kill every hostage you see. The more hostages you kill, the more max health you get. To get this variant of her, you just have to do one simple thing. You have to beat the hardest boss in the game with her. Excuse me, why? Speaking of boss fights, the only way you can fight her is by playing another character besides her. And it consists of her using spells you find throughout the game, and she is really mobile by the way. She also places down dolls that reflect damage back at you, so watch out where you're aiming. Keep in mind she will have an image above her that tells you her next spell, so if you manage to memorize all the spell icons, then that will help you fight her. When you beat her, her support will be her summoning this giant sword that does a huge amount of damage. To the point where you can just one shot some enemies and make distress zones a lot easier. Also a big point I forgot to mention is that each boss fight will be set in a designated world, meaning they will always be at the end of each of these worlds. Saffron, for example, will always fight you in the fire world. That's all I can really say about Saffron, a uh, very simple character, easy to use, and will definitely help you get used to the game. Uh. The world has been destroyed, but some people still need to be protected, and she does a fine job at that. Reva is part of a peaceful protest organization, but all of her higher ups are dead, probably because of the war. So, she decided to pick up a shield and protect those harmed in the war and also lead them into Eden. She is one of, if not the best girl in the game. I will not argue about this, I will not hear anyone out. She's 28, 6 foot 2, and her description is built. Tall, muscle lady who loves helping people, and she wears armor. 
Plus, she has like the best support in the game. God, I wish women were real. Dude, I want to jerk off! Fuck, I want to jerk off! Look at this! Reva is a bit tricky to play as her kit revolves around gaining shields and deflecting attacks. Her weapon allows you to deflect attacks, which, yeah, is basically a no you button. Look, he even says it. I forgot to mention the amount of references there are in this game. There's gonna be a lot of moments where you're just like, hey, I know that. Her starter artifact is that every time she moves, she gains one shield. So, despite her seeming to be a tank, you might actually have to be the most mobile to fully use her kit. I would highly recommend gaining Phalanx cards, as not only are they meant for her, but also obviously give her more shield. Which can be used for one of her starter spells that basically fires the amount of shield she has, and if it hits, you gain it all back as well. Absolutely busted. Unless you miss. In that case, all the shield's just gone. Which means all that time saving up was wasted. Congrats. That's totally something that didn't happen to me. She is undoubtedly one of the strongest characters if you fully learn how to play her. Be careful though, as reflecting attacks do cost mana, so you can't just spam it. Her other kit, Beat, will turn any damage you receive and fire it back, dealing 20 damage. Which is why she starts out with cards from the Misery Focus, a category with a lot of healing and self-pain cards. Overall, I do think it's weaker than their first kit, but in a way I can see it being better. As if you're not a pro gamer like me, the 6 shield you built up by moving around is essentially useless if you get hit right after. So, may as well substitute with a passive that allows you to fire some damage back. And you still keep Reflect as your weapon, so honestly, not a bad pick. Reva's boss fight relies a lot upon positioning, as Sheen uses her shield to reflect spells back, and these take up 3 rows. She'll also conjure up a lot of shield and then fire it back at you, and it also covers a lot of space, so watch out. She also summons some minions that are pretty weak in the beginning, but if you're fighting her in higher tiers, they become really annoying. Also, this move, which I, I, I fucking hate. Just try and read the trajectory and watch out because she'll sometimes move before doing another one. Now, let's explain why Reva has the best sport in the game. Now, I'm not great. Even though I just told you I was a pro gamer, I lied to you. There are a lot of times when I mess up, I fuck up. I fuck up. Reva, though, takes some pressure off me whenever that happens, and that's because she gives you a second chance. Right when you're about to die, she will swoop in drop you 400 health like the hero she is. This has seriously saved so many of my runs and is the main reason why I will always spare Reva. Well, unless I'm forced to. Also, Reva's boss fight will be within the ruins slash rocky world. Gunner. Gunner is a mercenary trying to find his way into Eden so that he retires at the old age of 16? Really? A 60 year old mercenary? I, I guess post war really hit him hard. By the way, he's a short king at 5'3 with an impatient attitude. So, yeah, probably shouldn't talk about his height. Now, Gunner, well, he's, he's just eh. Yeah, just eh. Keep in mind, these are just my opinions. So, if you play or have played him and you like him, hats off to you. But I don't really find that much enjoyment in his arsenal. Gunner's first variant, Mana Fire, relies on shooting enemies to quickly gain mana. You do lose a little bit of mana per fire, so make sure you actually hit a target so it isn't wasted. His artifact gives him an attack boost to his weapon every time you shuffle. So basically, let loose whenever you shuffle. Now he's a bit special, and that's because he can switch his weapon mid-game. During the artifact select screen, there's a chance you might find the M2 Hunter Seeker and the M1 Leo Fire. Leo Fire, whatever the fuck it's called. And one of them is kind of mid, not gonna lie. The Hunter Seeker is the blind fire option that allows you to hold down the fire button and focus on dodging, while the Lyle fire shoots at tiles in front of you. And yeah, they're they're both alright. The Hunter Seeker is more useful than the Lyle fire due to you being able to focus more on dodging. However, compared to the mana fire, I see both as inferior. Unless you're running weapon only, which there is a better option, just saying. We'll talk about that later. Mana Fire allows you to not only shoot enemies for a bit of damage, but also gain mana at a fast rate and use spells at the same time. If you combine Mana Fire with some Mana Regen artifacts, you'll pretty much have infinite mana for the rest of the game. Moving on to his second variant, which is called Bullet Hell, and this, this is where you start having fun. Look at this. Look at the description of this weapon, and you'll know exactly what it does. Hi. Anyway, I started blasting. Bah, bah. Wow. 
You have a machine gun, and your goal with this is to spray and pray. Pray, because you also don't have that much health, so careful. You shoot three ways, so even if you're focused on dodging, you're probably going to hit something. However, to do good damage with it, you have to use your preset artifact, the one that increases your damage during shuffling. So you have two options, a weapon only run, or a low spell run. There are a couple of spells that increase your shuffle time, and usually that would be a disadvantage, but in this case, it's actually more beneficial for you to run those. Shield spells, however, are kind of useless as you're going to be shuffling most of the time and you lose a lot of your shield each time you shuffle. About 40%. There is also an artifact that reduces that to 25%, but still, you're going to lose a lot of shield. There's also the RNG aspect of you not seeing that artifact once in that run. So, yeah, don't rely on that. Also, each time you shuffle, the time for it increases as well. So you're going to be waiting a bit until your spells come back. It has its ups and downs, but I think it does a solid job at producing a character that has the option to use both their weapon and spells. And unlike Saffron, Gunner's weapon will actually feel like it's actually hurting them. Mana Fire will always be the superior option to a weapon and spell run, but I think the clearer route here would be the weapon only run where you channel your inner Danny DeVito and hope that RNG gods bless you, like this build I have here. Now as you can see, my deck only has two spells, but these two spells are all I need. This is Time Stop. You know what it does, do I, do I even need to explain this to you? Time Stop is busted on this kit, as every time you shoot while using it, you awaken your inner Dio and get a whole firing squad ready to unload onto your enemies. Now I got lucky, super lucky because my second spell activates the artifacts that involve shuffling. And what was my preset artifact again? So now I have a minigun that shoots three ways, doing double the amount of damage, and I'm able to stack bullets thanks to stopping time. Yeah, I was having a little bit of fun doing this. Plus, with the added support of additional artifacts like getting 20 shield every time you shuffle, which isn't a lot, but hey, a little help comes a long way. And a long way it went because when I finally got to the doorsteps of Eden and fought one of the final bosses, I was getting extremely giddy, and panicked soon after because uh, this is one of the final bosses. Speaking of boss fights, Gunner's boss fight mostly involves dodging by going up and down each row. He'll throw these bombs in the air and based on where they're landing is where he'll fire. He also has this move where he'll slow down time and you have a limited amount of time to maneuver around his projectiles. Also this, this fucking move. He goes up in the air where he's untargetable and launches bombs down based on your position. Make sure you detonate these bombs early as they will eventually trap you and force you to take a massive hit. His support? Eh. Yeah, that's, that, it's also just eh. If you find yourself in a campfire zone, he'll give you some extra health, which can be good sometimes and also useless at times. The campfire already gives you 250 health, so at times it just feels really unnecessary. Gunner's boss fight will take place in the Firewall. Now you might be thinking, Saffron's also will take place in the Firewall. Well, there's a chance that you'll get either Saffron or Gunner to fight. The other boss that's supposed to show up in that world will appear later if you choose that same world again. Celice is the classic edgelord. You're a beta male, Sonic. She's described as cold and rude, and she's also 15 with, at the height of 5'3". She also makes a lot of ice puns, like, a lot. She'll probably become your first wall too if you're not used to moving around the field. I say this because just like her skill set, she's very movement based. She's also considered to be the high risk high reward character, and I think it's true, because in my opinion, she's one of the hardest characters in the game to get used to. Her first kit snow is kinda simple. Her weapon snow piercer allows her to dash across into the enemy's field, hitting in front and the whole world behind her. When hitting an enemy, she'll do a measly 10 damage, however, if you use the spell she's been given, her true strength is revealed. Slicey's first kit involves Frost. Now what is Frost? Does it slow him down? No. It's just a way to do a shit ton of damage in a short amount of time. To explain it in simple terms, each time you hit someone with a Frost spell, it stacks, and the max is 3. On that third stack, the enemy will take a total of 150 damage. 
So how does Selysene use this mechanic? Well, if they already have one or two stacks on them, then her weapon will activate the stack prior and deal a little bit more damage than the original of how it was supposed to be. If she attacks with one stack, she'll just do 80 damage. If she attacks with two stacks, she'll do 160 damage instead. Basically, frost stacks equal big damage, Silicy makes bigger damage more easier to obtain. Frost is incredibly strong, and a frost deck can easily destroy any enemy. Well, as long as you can hit your shots. She'll also gain mana based on how many frost stacks were on the enemy. Her starter artifact is also pretty good giving you 40 shield at the start of each battle, which can tank most attacks. However, that's not to say that you just need to look out for shields of frost. For example, in this deck that I made with poison instead. Not only were my enemies gain frostbite every like 2 seconds, but also slowly dying becoming weaker as the time goes on. Which is another thing that I love about this game. Characters with kits that center around a certain aspect of the game can still be modified to your liking. Now what if you don't like the frost mechanic, but still like the in your face type move? Well, I got good news for you, because her second kit, Invade, is the melee character in this game. Quotation marks, melee. Instead of attacking a row though, she dashes and hits one tile in front of her a couple of times. You deal 40 damage if you land all your attacks, but also run the risk of getting hit because you will go back to the position that you attacked from. The same applies to your first variant as well, but that is not the real reason you play this kit though. Her real strength is the ability to use close quarter spells. For example, Zenith. Now, Zenith seems like an extremely dangerous ability to use. However, with Celeste's ability to break past the boundary and go into the enemy's side, she can instead drop a mortar on that side. With this kit, a whole new variety of options open up, such as a strictly close quarters build, a hybrid range build, or a mobile range character, which may seem ridiculous at first, but her artifact accommodates that as well. Anyway, you get the drill. She's the in-your-face character that requires a lot of skill to fully use. Now, let's get on to your boss fight. The main thing you need to do is lock down where she's moving, as once again, MOBILE CHARACTER. At times, she'll all of a sudden go up to your face and swipe at you, but also, you have to watch out for when she does her multi-row attack. There will be a single icicle that will be delayed. Do not stay for more than a second though, and you'll be clear. Unless, you're fighting her tier 4 and above. She also has this move where she surrounds you with the same icicles. Stay in the middle, and keep an eye on which one gets activated. Trust me, it's a lot easier if you're calm and focused on it. you'll get a brief window to attack her after each attack. That's pretty much the base of her boss fight. She'll definitely get you used to moving around the tiles, and honestly, went from my absolute most hated in the beginning, to one of my favorites. Her support's also pretty good. She'll just dash and hit the enemy a couple of times, and then dip right after. It does alright damage, and is a nice way to start the fight. And, obviously, her boss fight is in the ice world. Did you really need me to say that to you? Dispenser going up. The next character is Hazel, and she's the engineer character. Okay, so the next character we have is Tara, and she's pretty interesting. Alright, alright, we'll talk about Hazel. She's 24 and at the height of 5 foot 4, and obviously Hazel worked as an engineer. Heck yeah! Her personality is persistent and ambitious, and apparently she also knows Saffron, so there's a little lore for you there. Okay, look. Her kit revolves around building stuff. Do I hate her? Not really. I used to love playing Hazel. Because of that simplicity, in fact, she used to be my main in the beginning. Her weapon allows her to give shield to her buildings and also boosts a little bit of their power. Her artifact also gives her 40 shield every time she places a buildable down. You can also smack people with it if you want doesn't do much, but it's pretty satisfying. Now, there's just one problem I have. Buildings are kind of trash in this game. Like, they don't really do that much damage and don't have that much health as well. Also, you need to be in like melee range to boost your turrets, which can lead you to being hit because your weapon also anchors you, so you can't cancel the animation. 
Then you have another problem with the buildings, like taking up your tiles, which means less room to dodge. My point being is that the buildings just become more of a hassle in the late game. Enemies and bosses just move around too much and also do way more damage. You'll barely have any time to put down your turrets, and even if you do, they might just get instantly vaporized. Bruh. You can move your turrets around for some better positioning with some spells, but that doesn't solve the previous problems very much. Plus, you might make the mistake of going forward when deploying something, which can completely cancel it out, and now you just wasted some mana. Early game, the buildings are great, honestly. They're great sponges that do a good amount of damage, but they really become an obstacle later on. Also, I just want to say her support on paper seems great, but in reality, it's really annoying. She'll place a turret somewhere on the map, usually in front of an enemy, and this means that you won't be able to get that little bit of burst damage that you can get in the beginning of every match. The turret doesn't really do that much damage later on, and is really just there to actually help the enemy instead of helping you. This is especially during boss fights where she'll just throw the turret right in front of them and you won't be able to do anything and just have to deal with that turret just shooting, doing literally like 20 damage per hit. And the turret's probably just gonna get destroyed. Now I could just suck at her, you know? That is 100% a probability. It's not like I want to hate her too, I love characters that focus on building things. I play Engineer and Risk Rain too for Christ's sake. Well, luckily. My dislike for Hazel only applies to her first variant. Well, kinda. Her second variant, Teardown, does exactly what it says and tears down these annoying buildings. Her weapon now breaks buildings in return for full mana and a small boost to your spells as well. Plus, her artifact allows you to launch a fragment from a destroyed building that does 40 damage. Obviously, this is more spell based and to be honest, that's enough of a reason for why I prefer this one. It doesn't completely disregard building, and still makes it viable in the early stages. Then after you go up a couple stages, you can start using the buildings as more of a projectile. Also, pro tip, either get a bunch of mana regen, or get a lot of buildings early. Because holy fuck, her base mana regen is so slow. Okay stop right there, remember when I said she has low mana regen? She actually has zero but when she destroys a building she'll have low regen. Either way you'll have to rely on the free buildings she gets in the beginning. Also I'm using text to speech cause I'm lazy as fuck. Now her boss fight on the other hand is uh... If, if I could describe her, it's literally facing the boss versus the boss as a playable character. The shit she pulls out for you is just like, what the fuck did she even get this from? She can send missiles after you, spawn flame turrets that limit your movement, trap you and summon pistons that pummel you, where the fuck did she even get this? Her boss fight can either be challenging or trivial depending on what tier you're fighting her. Do not underestimate her buildings, as it can seriously get crowded and chaotic. You'll always find her in the forest world, and... It's not a complete wasteland, unlike the other places. Isn't that your teeth? This is a, um, this is a smoky, a uh, smoky granite. Oh. I can tell by the flavor. Oh, Terra. You are one complex character, both lore-wise and gameplay-wise. Terra is 27 years old at the height of 5'6". She's also a cult leader. That's right. Even at the end of the world, we still have cults. If someone decided that they wanted to leave, the standard procedure was to tie them to the ceiling, pluck all of their hairs out of their body before Roke would defecate on them. Her first kid is, um, yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting. In a good way though, with the ability to break tiles. Whenever a tile is broken, then no one can go on that tile anymore. The tiles can also be cracked by certain spells or artifacts, and these give you one last chance to step on them before breaking. Her artifact also grants some mana regen based on how many broken tiles there are. So if you haven't gotten the message yet, your goal is to trap your enemies and bombard them with spells. She's one of the hardest characters in the game to control as her kit revolves around the hearth focus, aka the rock spells. Most of these spells involve cracking or breaking the floor, so they limit your movement a lot. Sometimes you can even trap yourself, 
And that is the worst thing you can do to yourself in this game. If you're able to balance between trapping enemies and dodging, then she's a solid character. Not my style, but I can see her being really good if someone can play her right. Especially with her ability to just cut off any exits. This kid has a lot of variety besides the hearth focus, like grabbing some fire spells and reenacting that one FNAF ending. And you know what? I think the creator also had a similar idea to that, because her second kit, Pyro, just spawns flames, and her artifact is the same, except instead of broken files, it's how much shit can you lie in fire. And this kit is fun. If you get the right artifact, then you can easily melt enemies. Take this giant gate, for example. It has the highest amount of HP in the game, and just watch as it just melts. The only bad thing about this kit is that there really isn't that much variety, unlike her first one. But, it's a nice change from her first kit, and hey, if you're feeling like you want to start the next National Forest Fire, then Pyro's for you. Moving on to Tira's boss fight, and I, I fucking, I fucking hate it. Mm. This is the hardest boss in the game that is not a final boss, excluding the shopkeeper. Not only does she teleport around a bunch, but she also forces you to be on the move at all times. You are rarely ever going to be staying still. And if you are, you better get ready, because you're going to get slammed in the next second. She has multiple moves which will try and trap you, has rarely any opportunities to get hit, and these annoying fucking diamonds that, that do have a pattern, but I can never get the timing right. Probably because I get greedy and target her instead of worrying about myself, but that doesn't disclose the other shit I have to deal with. Anyway, I hate her, and is the main reason I will always go to a ruined world early, so I don't have to fight her in her higher tiers. Good pro tip, by the way. Fight the bosses that you hate first, so you don't have to deal with the harder versions later. Well, let's move on to something more positive, and that's her support. Her support will just start with her breaking tiles, and uh, that, that's pretty much it. It's good. Not amazing, but not horrible either. Definitely not needed, but also doesn't hurt to have. And like I said earlier, you can find her in the room world. Wow, what a surprise, she has to do with rocks. Shiso is the character I wanted to talk about the most. Why? Because he is tied with Selyse as my favorite character in the game. He is my beloved, and while I also love Selyse, she's 15. Shiso is 26 years old at the height of 5 foot 10. He's a money hungry thief and very shady. Hello, I like money. But that doesn't stop me from adoring him. He could rob me and I'd still gush all about him. And I put him in such high regard because of his kits. And because he has one of my favorite skins in the game. His first kit, Execute, is just broken. But the good kind of broken. The kind of broken where you're just annihilating everything, but with a smile on your face. His first kit involves money specifically hoarding money. He has no artifact, but he doesn't really need that shit because his revolver converts dollar bills into bullets. His revolver's damage will be based on half of the amount of money you have. You lose $3 each time you shoot, but if you kill something, you instead gain $10. <laughs> Capitalism. With this system and the plan of obtaining as much money as you can, what do you think will happen in the end game? Shiso has the best kit for a weapon only run, that is undeniable, but he is a little underpowered in the beginning, because obviously you're poor and need to grab some loose change under vending machines. Also unless you're running shields, beware as you are not only anchored, but it takes a second to shoot, so if you shoot at the wrong time, you'll leave yourself wide open. So don't just hold down the fire button and expect an instant win, you still need to use your brain to dodge. Shields are obviously really good, but also any root spells will also help you out. 
And if you manage to get time slow or time stop, they'll be dead before they even know it. Now obviously, you're going to want to avoid the shopkeeper, because your goal is to save money, not spend it. So treasure zones are going to be the main thing you're going after. Artifacts are also not necessary, so just become a money goblin and go for the coin. Huh? Ah, yeah. If you need removals or upgrades though, you might need to kill one of the bosses, as they usually drop those. But spells are really just a backup weapon when you're playing Shiso, at least this kit. So that was the first kit. Very high damage, but they cost your mobility. Very fun. It can get boring if you keep on playing them, but I don't really play them that much because of that reason, so I have fun either way. His second kit, however, takes a major turn from that and relies on an endless supply of knives. That's right, you become your local British citizen and run around throwing knives at people. And it's one of the funnest things to do in this game. Your weapon instead of a revolver- Fuck, fucking revolver got me again. Your weapon instead of a revolver is replaced with a knife trick that allows you to throw a knife and catch it. Doing this will add a kunai to your deck and as long as you have mana, you can have as many kunais as you want. The reason being is because each kunai doesn't cost any mana, so you can just spam them out. The artifact you're given makes kunais apply fragile onto an enemy, which makes them take 1.5% more damage, and your spells just give you more kunais than use. And it's hilarious just throwing an endless supply of knives. You do need to be a little bit close because the kunais can only go up to like 4 tiles, so make sure you've closed the gap before letting loose. Spells, once again, aren't really required here. You can finish the game with the ones you're given at the beginning. Maybe you can use some support ones that involve shield or mana, but artifacts are really going to be the main thing you're going for. Like making fragile do more damage, or kunais are now poisonous. If you've ever done a shiv run in Slay the Spire, it's pretty much the equivalent to that. Is it stronger than the previous kit? No. But it is still a lot of fun to use and solidifies Shido. Shido why did I call him Shido? This is, I'm thinking of fucking Blue Lock. That's so. Shizo as one of the funnest characters to play. So, boss fight time. His boss fight is fast paced and but also really deadly. He'll usually start off with this weird dash attack that attacks different parts of the map. Pretty easy to deal with, but the next ones require good positioning, like his trap placement ability. He'll just lob over a bunch of bear traps and try to push you into them. If you get stuck in one of them, he'll just go up to your face and blast you. This does a ton of damage, and especially on higher tiers, because instead of once, he'll do it twice. His other attack that forces you to move is this large wave that covers three rows. If you get hit by it, you will automatically shuffle your deck and do 60 damage. It's really more of an annoyance than a dangerous ability, and it must be dodged. It can't be blocked by a building, another reason why they suck, and it can't be reflected either. Well, you can reflect attack, but it'll still shuffle you. Now, his last two moves are pretty similar, but also pretty easy to dodge. A little bit. The volleyball. First, the harder one in my opinion, he'll dash to you and do this cross-like pattern. He'll do this a couple of times and then leave. And I kid you not, you just need to dodge it by moving a couple of steps. Sometimes one step, sometimes two steps, sometimes three. But it's really all about reaction time for this boss fight. Well, now I think about it, mostly all of them. His other one is where he comes over and just shoots an entire row. You just need to move a couple of steps and you'll be good. The real danger of these moves are really just the startup because they can easily catch you off guard, so keep an eye out for that. Overall, his fight is pretty enjoyable and simple. His support is alright, just like Gunner who will appear at campfires and give you some money and stuff some health. Just a slight upgrade to Gunner for me, but nothing too crazy. And hey, it's the thought that counts. Because remember, he's really money hungry, so him handing over that cash and respecting us makes him even more commendable. And yes, I'm making more reasons on why to like him. You'll find him in the forest just like Hazel, but 10 times better because he's way more fun to play, he's a better character overall, his boss fight's better, and... Ah yes, the elegant, the beautiful, and charming Violet. Age 30 and 5 foot 8, she is elegant and dignified. She also has the most unique weapon out of all the characters. Her first kit, Double Time, is the most versatile weapon in the game. It has four moves, and each move is based on how you move. I get it! I don't get it! Basically, whenever you use your weapon, you will have four ways to go. Each way correlates to a different move that you'll do. If you step right, she'll fire a shot that does 60 damage. If you go up, you get one trinity. Down, restores two and a half mana. Left, 
you have 60 shield and only 60 shield. And if you stay in the center, you get fragile. For artifact feather, increase your spell power based on half of your fragile stacks. Undoubtedly the most complex and hardest character in the game. One, you are a glass cannon if you take advantage of your artifact. Two, you have to quickly think of the situation you're in and how your weapon best works in it. Some spells have additional effects if you have fragile, like one of her starter spells, Frostbite. Honestly, I don't play Violin often, but when I do, it's fun to learn her. Her versatility provides a lot more deck variety as well. Violet's first kit is essentially the Swiss army knife of this game. You need protection? Move left. Need mana? Move down. Have a spell in your slot that needs trinity? Go up. Not doing enough damage? Get some fragile stacking. Your only downfall with this kit is again weakening yourself with each stack of fragile, but also using your ability in a bad position. This comes especially late in the game, because there are going to be a lot of times where there are just a shit ton of attacks and you can use your weapon at the wrong time. Now does her second kit provide an easier way to play? <laughs> nope. Her second is even more confusing to use. <laughs> well, at least to me. Instead of dancing, you're poisoning yourself now. You heard me. But at least you get a lot of mana regen if you don't move. Your artifact vaccine heals you but also gives you a lot of poison as well. You are a mana siphoning machine who can bust out as many spells as you want. But whatever you do, don't stop using your weapon. You see, the way poison works is that it has a timer, and before it activates, each time poison is added, it resets the timer. So whenever you use your weapon, the timer will reset and you won't take any damage. But at the same time, the more times you use it, the more poison builds, and if you forget to use it, you'll be hit by it. However, you'll be able to use high cost spells more freely now, since your mana will, hopefully, always be high. I don't think I need to explain the downsides of this, since it's pretty clear what happens if you make a mistake. Moving on to her boss fight, and it's, it's amazing. My favorite boss fight in the game, by far. The way she attacks and the way you're forced to dance based on her moves, and, and the theme, oh my god, the theme. It's ironic how they gave the musician the best song in the game. Okay. Enough gushing about our theme though. Let's talk mechanics. Violet will attack you based on her song and will always start out with these green notes. Don't be alarmed, the notes are there to help you, as they give you shield. Based on how the song goes, the notes will either be really fast or slow. After the last green note, she will do a move where she'll cover in the entire field in a giant wave. If you manage to step on every note, then you're good, you won't take any damage from it. But if you're terrible at dancing, you're gonna get hit, and it's gonna be a lot of damage. She also sometimes plays down these massive boon boxes, destroy them immediately. At first, they only seem like they take up a small area, but seconds later, they'll start taking up almost the entire field. This goes especially bad with her next move, where she just sprays down a shit ton of attacks. Don't panic and watch the attacks under you. If it's red, you'll be safe for a couple of seconds until it strikes. Then, if the tile next to you is clear, or has just gotten a red sign, you can tap into the next tile, and repeat until it's all over. Overall, it's my favorite boss fight in the game, and is always the one I try to save at the end. It really does test your movement skills, and I really love that each of her attacks are on beat with music. Her support is also really good as well, probably one of the best to be honest. She just drops in and gives you 80 shield and some spell power. She also has my favorite skin in the game, and even though I don't play her that much, I can admit her kit is incredibly unique, so hats off to the developer for this. That's why he's the GOAT! THE GOAT! <laughs> Lastly, Violet will be waiting for you in the ice world, so don't keep her waiting.
finally, last but not least, the shopkeeper. Now, the shopkeeper is different, very different. She's 27 years old and has the height of 5 foot 6. While she appears sweet on the outside, her sadistic side is not to be forgotten. She only has one kit, but boy, does this one kit really go all out. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> Let's be clear first. In order to get the shopkeeper as a character, you have to beat her first. Which, easier said than fucking done. Boys, take him to the shopkeeper. No! No, please! Anything with that! No! She's the second hardest boss in the game. And the only reason why I can't really put her up as first is because you can easily trivialize her. Her moves are just... What the fuck is going on? There's just one move that looks impossible, but it's actually kind of easy once you get the timing. But then you get moves like this, or, or this, and you better get used to fighting her if you want to get all the achievements. Now, I mentioned before that you can make her a lot easier. Something that makes her go from the hardest boss in the game into kind of the easiest. Kind of. And that's with Soul Link. Soul Link allows you to tether an enemy. This makes it so that they will get hurt if you attack something else. So unless she's in front of you, make sure to link her before this ice trap. Then after, break forward and watch. Blood fairy kill, please. Yep, just like that. One of the hardest bosses is just cheese like that. It doesn't really make it that easier since you won't always get soul link and also she might not even do the ice trap move in the first place. So good luck, that's all I'm saying. Good news though, while she has one kit, this one kit is amazing. Let's start with her weapon. It sucks, don't use it. Now you might have noticed that she has one of the smallest health pools out of all the characters. But not to fret my friend, as her artifact turns money into the max amount of health that you can have. She also drops money when she gets hit, and you can pick it up, but it only heals 10 health, so it's kind of not worth it to be honest. You do lose some of your max HP though, so if you have the opportunity, go ahead. Now, you might think to yourself, this character kind of sucks. I mean, her weapon is useless, her artifact is alright, and yeah, her health scales larger over time, but you still need to be able to heal it to full. If you think this though, you're a stupid idiot because I haven't even finished! And yes, I'm slandering you! Her real strength is this. Oh my god. That's right, you can get free artifacts and spells. Though, for some reason, restocking and buying all this stuff costs money. You know, even though you're the shopkeeper. And you can donate your own blood for money as well. Either way, this is still amazing. I didn't even find this out until halfway through my run when I wanted to remove a spell. While restocking seems dangerous, during the late game, unless you've somehow been losing money in the entire run, you have no reason not to restock. You really only need 800 to 1000 HP in order to feel safe. Any more than that is pretty much overkill, you don't really need that much. Unless you suck, but you know, not my problem. Since you earn HP through money, it's best to visit treasure zones to increase your HP, and campfire zones to heal up to your current maximum health. And by the way, since you gain money after every fight, your max HP is going to be constantly getting bigger. I absolutely love this, and almost makes it feel like a sandbox in a way. This is the closest you'll get to being able to make your own custom build. Well, unless you put in a specific seed, but that gets a little complicated. Now, of course, the restock items are random, but the ability to gain extra spells and artifacts really does make this one-of-a-kind character. The only character I can think of that's similar to this is fucking Geraldo from Bloons Tower Defense. Shopkeeper is a fantastic character, and while I have no idea what the developer would do, I really wish she had a second kit. Maybe make this kit the true sandbox experience, with you being able to choose what kind of artifacts and spells you want, and you don't need to sacrifice anything. Basically a creative mode for this game, which yeah, is completely broken, but it allows the player to have a bit more fun and, you know, experiment a little. They can also try out all the super rare cards, as after playing this game for almost 40 hours, I still don't think I've gotten to use every Calamity card, as they are that rare. And I get that it takes away from the roguelike charm, but Rift of Rain 2 proves that even if you're given the choice to choose, we'll most likely go back to where it all started. 
as there isn't anything more fun than randomly getting the god run. Besides, that's the reason why we play roguelikes. It's for that randomness. So no matter what, we'll always go back to our roots. Plus, I do have a fair way for you to earn this as a reward, but that requires me to talk about the final bosses of this game. Oh, I forgot to mention that her support just drops a bunch of money on the ground. It'd be good for Shiso, I guess. Hello. So, we're finished with all the characters, and, uh, you know, I, I just thought, why not just rank them, you know? Rank them based on my personal experience and my opinion. Uh, if you played this game and you have any conflicting opinions with mine, uh, fuck you, I'm better. I made a one hour long video, uh, so I'm, I'm automatically correct. So, yeah, deal with it. Okay, so first, we have Gunner. We put Gunner for some reason. Gunner is, well... He's fun. Like, well, part of him is fun. Mana Fire is good. I think it's a really good. It's a solid, like, first kit. But it is kind of boring. And we're all, we're also counting in, like, how fun they are and how, how good they are and how fun they are. And I think Gunner's both, like... He has, like, one kit that's fun and the other kit's just, like, more, like, useful. But I think B. I think B is good enough. Bullet Hell can be kind of, like, useless at times, because if you don't get any good artifacts or spells that, like, accommodate for his weapon, then you're pretty much going to do nothing the entire game. But I'll put B. Alright, next we have is Hazel, and Hazel's going back to D tier, because she's fucking gar- Okay, buildings are a good early game. I, I will admit that. And her teardown kit does, you know, salvage her. Her first kit, though, is just, like, I, I will stand by this. Buildings are so trash in this game. She barely gets out of D tier. Barely, just barely. Reva, best girl. I'm not saying mommy. Okay, but anyway, Reva. Mm, I'm thinking S or A. She's pretty good. I don't know, but her second kid is just like. Why would I don't know, man? Even the like positives I set for like Reva, I think it would just be better just you know run the first kid. I think her second kid is just like very much like underwhelming compared to her first one. I don't know. You know, I'll put A, because their second kid, like, I could, I don't know, I could never really get into it. Saffron, S tier. She's gotta be S tier. Alright, she's, she's fun. She has three kits, she has the most kits in the game, and they're all pretty damn different, to be honest, kinda, a little bit. But, like, her first kit involves, like, survivability. Her second kit is more of deck building and all that, and also can get you out of really tough situations. And her third kit is just, like, this glass cannon type, which, after playing it a bit more... I really like it too. Overall, I think Saffron is just like really just, she's probably the best character in the game, let's be honest. Well, other than, uh... <clears throat> but yeah, Saffron is like definitely top three character. Celice, oh my goodness, Celice. She's, I, I think she has to go A. Her kits are just so fun. The fact that you can just dash into the enemy's field is just like, it's, complete, it's completely different from like any other character. And the fact that you can just be like very close quarters. There are a lot of course, um, I can't spell, what the fuck is, what, bro, <laughs> there are a lot of close quarter spells in this game, like a lot more than you would think, and also for artifact as well, and, you know, they really do feel like they were made for her, they probably were, they probably were, I don't, I don't understand, like, I don't understand how any other character could use them, maybe like Shisa with, no, you can, I don't know, I can't, I don't know. either way, she's really fun, is she good, I think she's solid, you know, she's definitely lacking compared to, like, other top tiers, but I think she's a solid character, and she's extremely fun. She's probably one of the most funnest characters out there. Next. You, you know I gotta do my more justice. <laughs> Shiso is my favorite character in the game. He's super fun. He's super good. He probably has the most creative kit out of, like, including both of them, out of every character. I really can't think of any other character that has, well, maybe Violet, yeah, definitely Violet beats him on that. But either way, like, he's just so fun and so good. Execute literally demolishes anything he meets, and Kunai is just really fun to just spam out knives. And if you get the right artifacts for Kunai, like, you can actually do some serious stuff. Anyway, best character in the game, you know what, hold on, what? Oh, fuck. Oh, you know what, hold on. There you go, there you go, that's much better. Okay, next, we have uh, probably the best character, statistically, the best character in the game. Free artifacts, 
Why is she? Damn. Oh my god. She, oh my god. Jesus Christ. She's fighting back. All right. There we go. Free artifacts. Free spells. It's pretty easy to just like stock up on health and then just like, you know, get a shit ton of health. Like as you saw before, I had over 2000, which is way too much unless you're like going for like one of the big endings or the big ending. She's just like, she's the best character. Like <laughs> I, I can't, what the fuck am I else am I supposed to say? She could buy her own perks and all that stuff. Also, Shopkeeper is no longer on, like, the map, so she eliminates, like, that option. So you, you can have more treasure in campfire zones and mini boss zones a lot more, meaning that you can get a lot more stuff. Either way, best character in the game, probably, but not better than Shiso. In terms of fun value, she's a spell. She's, like, basically spells. Her weapon is useless. It's complete garbage. And uh, she's just really good. <laughs> she's just really good. She's pretty much the best character in the game. Okay, Terra. Terra, I've... Mm, Terra's really confusing, because her break is pretty meh. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty meh. You know, I'm thinking between B or C, but the reason why I'm thinking towards B more is because Pyro. Pyro is really fun if you get the right artifacts and spells. Like, it's just fun to just set everything on fire. Like, I had a build, as you saw before, I had a build where I got an artifact, one artifact, there's two artifacts that can, like, really change your game. One of them is, uh... It lowers their defense based on like how much fire damage they're taking and the other is like every time they take fire damage you get some shield and if you get one of these and you get a shit ton of fire spells you are pretty much like either melting them or you are unkillable especially on like the gate like like you just bully the gate with this kit like actually if you get the right artifacts break however is just like more meh it's really not because like you need cracking spells as well, or tile breaking spells, and that can really fuck with you. Unless you get an artifact that just like completely gets rid of that problem. I don't know, Terra is very just, uh, meh. She's just meh. Her pyro is really fun, but her break is just like underwhelming. And half the times when you break like tiles and you try to trap them, especially on bosses, she'll they'll literally just teleport out of there. Like, I don't know what, I don't know how they escaped. It's so weird. So yeah, I'll, I'll give her B tier. All right, last but not least, we got Violet. And Violet is, she, she's gotta be the A tier. Maybe even S tier, but you know what? I'm gonna put it A tier, cause she is really hard to play. I don't really think I need to say much about Violet. Her character speaks for itself. She's a really fun character to play, unless you don't really like, you know, learning difficult characters. If you don't like that, then she's really not the character for you. But if you like characters with like big learning curves, she's definitely for you. It is hard in the like later game or the end game because at times it's going to be really hard to use your weapons. Either way, I still think she's really good if you do learn how to play her. Compared to Slicey and Reva though, I think they are like all they're they're hard characters too to learn, but they are not as hard and their payoff is way more better if you fully learn to play them and they do better in the late game as well. You could also put Gunner above. Okay, well, yeah, Gunner and Gunner is Violet above Gunner. Now that I think about it. Oh, hold on. I'm actually thinking about this because <laughs> Gunner's mana fire is really good. Like, actually, it's really good. It's a really good way to get mana back. But <sighs> it's not as fun though. But Violet, <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck it, fuck it. We'll, we'll, we'll keep Violet in. Yeah, she is barely. Yeah, there's no B plus here, and I'm too lazy to add one, but she would probably be in like B plus. All right, let's just say Violet is a B plus, but we're gonna keep her in A, just to like, you know, keep the Violet mains happy. Please don't kill me. Anyway, that, that was it, yeah. Um, my, my tier list is correct, is factually correct. Uh, you cannot do anything to disapprove this. Uh, yeah. This is very last minute, by the way. Like, I just, I just thought of this idea. This is, I literally finished up everything. Uh, so, I, <laughs> I just literally just smashed this thing in. So, yeah, that's why I didn't make a strict route at all. Which, I shouldn't need to. This is a tearless video. It shouldn't take that much. We're getting too deep in this. Go back to the video.
Finally, we have arrived. After talking about each character and their kits, we've finally taken a step near the end of the video. But first, we have to talk about the late and end game content that this game has. I will be talking about the endings of each route though, so you have been warned. The Neutral Route The Neutral Route is the result of killing at least one boss. After defeating every boss, you'll be at Eden's doorstep where you'll face the gate. The gate has the highest amount of HP of any enemy in the game and requires your utmost attention. Well, unless you're Chiso. The good thing about fighting the gate is that you can just spam spells as its hitbox takes up every row. Bad news though, it has a lot of attacks. From missiles, to these weird spotlights, to lasers that take up half the field, and machine gun fire, as well as this weird tracking thing that follows you. This gate has a whole arsenal, and the worst part is, is that these moves often overlap with each other. Luckily though, there's a solution. A lot of these moves come from turrets that have health. So, if you destroy each part, that move will get shut down. However, this is only momentarily, and they will come back online. I have a hard time doing this and just pull out the random shit go meme, and most of the time it works. Most of the time. If you're not like me though and have the ability to watch both attacks and target each part of the gate, then that'll be your ticket to victory. If you manage to beat the gate though, then that's it. You finally made it. It's here. Through all those blood, sweat, and tears, you finally made it. You are one step away from Eden. And then some woman comes down and kills you. Why? Well, silly, Eden's a perfect utopia, and murderers do not fit within paradise. Yes, even if you've killed one or two bosses, no matter what happens, you'll always die at the end of this. Except hostages, because, uh, they're kind of annoying, to be honest. After beating the neutral route, you'll be given the option to go into health pass. We'll talk about that later. Now, instead of murdering the bosses that attack you for no reason, you sick animal, instead, you spare them. You've arrived, once again. And now the gate is here to let you in for sparing instead, and okay, never mind. Wait, isn't that Terra? Okay, let's just uh, do a little brief lore explanation for what happened here, or what I got from Reddit. So, apparently, she has two alter egos, and they split due to her being involved with some dark magic. Hey, she's a cult leader, anything can happen. Apparently all the lore is from the art book, but I can't find a trace of it online. It does exist, but it seems to be a Kickstarter reward, and I can only find mentions of it online. So, sadly, we'll just have to trust Reddit and Steam forums. I'll leave a link to a Reddit comment that summarizes the story pretty well. Okay, anyway, Terra's alter ego, Terrible, yes, that's her actual name, arrives to stop you from heading into Eden. And Seraph, who killed you for destroying the gate, doesn't appear for some reason. An imperfection to be cleansed. Terrible's fight is basically just Terra, but she found a box of war weapons to use on you. And maybe that's why Seraph didn't show up. A mere object. She has mortars firing down at you that take up a large portion of your field. Each have a different size too, so it can catch you off guard. She also has these weird light diamond things that move in a strange pattern, as well as shockwaves that, if you have the timing down, aren't really that bad. She can also spawn orbs that have a set pattern, but still hit me because I suck, and this weird attack that chases you, and if it hits you, it drains your mana. Last but not least, at the end of these moves, she'll sometimes call lasers from the sky, but despite all of this, and maybe dying once or twice, 
you manage to break through and beat her. And after all that, she somehow heals to 500 HP and brings you down to 1 HP. So that was a fucking lie. And then after that, Terrible charges up one more attack to finish the job. Is this really the end? Of course not. Instead, Riva shows up, blocks the attack, proving that she is in fact the best girl of this game. And then the whole gang shows up and proceeds to beat the living shit out of her. Like, literally. Look at this. After the beating of a century ends, you're given the choice to end or spare her. And like the good Samaritan you are, you decide to spare her. Psych! And Seraph doesn't show up. To be fair, Terrible did seem like she was going to be a little violent when it comes to Eden. But finally, at last, you take a step into Eden with your new pals and the credits roll. Within the credits, there's a picture where you can see the whole gang eating together and it's really wholesome. Also, if you really want to know what happens if you spare Terrible, she just turns good and goes into Eden with you, and in the picture you can also see her there. It's a nice way to end the game knowing that the gang is just sitting there together having fun. But what if you didn't want people to have fun? What if you wanted to destroy it instead? The genocide route is what you expect, everyone dies by your hand. The sad somber tone that plays whenever a boss died becomes this distorted version of the victory theme. Thus, after killing the first boss, the journey to Vanquish Eden begins. Side note, I picked the shopkeeper because you need this like dark magic spell to get the ending, and the only way to get it is by killing her, and obviously I didn't want to go through all the trouble of killing her, is what I would have said, but I did it in order to get Saffron's third kit. And oh my god, fighting shopkeeper over and over and over again is just ugh. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? If you're doing this route, just find a way to kill Shopkeeper, probably the Link way, the Soul Link way that I mentioned earlier, play her, and then kill everyone. Unless you want to go through the pain of getting her third kit, which, uh, get good at the game. Anyway, time to kill more people, I guess. After murdering all your former friends, you arrive at the gate, and you destroy it so hard, you don't even get a boss fight. You're that strong now, and afterwards, you step into Eden, and look at the utopia it was supposed to bring. Okay, let's take a break from storytelling to talk about Eden. Eden is the hardest stage, and it truly shows. It will really test you if you're ready or not. Eden has these giant alien-like machines that have a ton of health, and also incredibly dangerous movesets. Alone, they're actually not that bad, and can be dealt with pretty easily, but when they're together, on the other hand, is when it becomes chaotic. Some have moves that can cover half of the field, some can fire damage back at you if you attack it, and some restrict your movement so you can't move away easily. If there are multiple, which there definitely will be, then you need to focus immediately on the one you have the most trouble with. For me, it was those big turrets. Their attack was actually fairly easy to deal with, it was just the damage back that I did that caught me off guard. However, after every fight, you get a little reward, a little, little treat. And that's hearing the theme, Chaos in Paradise.
it fits perfectly with this tune of impending disaster. You're not a wanderer looking for safety this time. Instead, you're an invader trying to destroy the last safe haven on the planet. And after jamming out to this absolute banger, you finally meet her, face to face. You've ruined her Eden, but she can still fix it apparently, as long as you aren't around. This is Sarah, and she's the hardest boss in the game. You're pretty much fighting God. <laughs> Before you start though, she has one last thing to say to you. That's right, the whole field is open for both of you. You can just go on either side and will switch positions. And she moves so fucking much. She can teleport all of a sudden to one side and do this massive swipe that does a big amount of damage. She can also place down these orbs that shoot in four different directions when destroyed, fire big waves of energy, whatever the hell this is, trap you with the same orbs and destroy a bunch of them causing a chain reaction, shoot a beam that scatters a ton of particles, and it's absolute chaos. It's full of adrenaline and half of the fight will just be you trying to dodge all of her attacks and barely scrape by. If anyone does this damage list, I salute you as the god of no grass. <laughs> But, despite all the impossible factors in the way, with your skill and a ton of luck, you manage to win. Or you watch this video. Either way, it's the end, yay! Seraph just goes on to whine about her duty being ruined, but, but wait, what's going on? All of a sudden your deck is filled with these dark spells, and Seraph is about to turn back time? So, by reflex, or because you're an idiot who almost had to reset the run because he was too busy celebrating his victory, you fire the dark spell and kill Seraph before she can reset time. Congratulations, you destroyed the only safe place on the planet after a post-war. What do you get? Nothing. You get nothing. Unless you're playing Saffron, but you get absolutely nothing if you play any other character. Which is why I think the sandbox kit would have been so cool to get after being Seraph as shopkeeper. There's really only one thing to do left besides unlocking any missing kits, and that's Hell Pass. What's the Hell Pass? Hell Pass is the gauntlet of pain in every other roguelike. It's like pouring hot sauce on already spicy food, you masochist. First, it starts off with enemies gain artifacts with small buffs, then more obstacles and hazards, and you know that aim marker that helps you know which direction the spell's going? I hope you got used to every spell in the game because it's gone now. Oh, by the way, you also have low defense, and bosses being spirit grant less health. Your max HP gets reduced, and now enemies have two artifacts instead of one. And you know what? Fuck it! Boost your luck stat, which yes, grants the ability to get more rare cards, but the difficulty scaling is also raised. So all the tough enemies in the late game are gonna be seen a lot earlier. Enemies now regenerate, bosses start at tier two now, and you lose 60% of your shield now whenever you shuffle. And now there are even evil hostages. That's right, they got sick of accidentally being killed. Shop prices are also raised, Oh, and here he comes. Right now, I'd say we're at like 75% on the difficulty scale. But with Hell Pass 13, all bosses start at max tier. So any boss you had trouble with at max tier will show up no matter what. And lastly, Hell Pass 14. Oh boy. It's just a minor change, you know? You, you just start at 1 HP now. And remember, the bosses are at max tier, so you better hope you don't get matched up with your worst boss in the first world. But don't worry my friend, 
because you may have been shot, but I can put a bandage on you. You'll still be hurt, but now you won't bleed a lot, since there are ways to work around the last health pass. Shopkeeper nearly negates this with their artifact of increasing health every time you get money. Some artifacts can also increase your health, and there are also packs within the shops that grant more max health. Also, little boosts here and there with spells that give a tiny bit of HP every time you use it. I think Saffron's solo kit was specifically made for this, as her artifact increases health every time you kill a hostage. And you don't have to feel guilty about it, because they're trying to kill you as well. So, if you want to throw yourself into the Gauntlet of Pain for a bit of a challenge, then I'd recommend playing Saffron Solo or Shopkeeper. Oh, me? I'm not doing it. I already rebeat Melania this year without Rivers of Blood. You think I'm going to suffer more after I've just recovered? In terms of content though, that's the end game. That's it. There is PvP and co-op, but sadly, those can only be accessed locally. So if you have a second controller and a friend who lives nearby, good for you. If you don't, sucks for you. PvP in this type of game sounds like such a cool idea. And I think it'd be really cool if the developer of the game went on to make like a fighting game spinoff. They did, if you can't tell where this is going. The developer of One Step From Me, Thomas Moon King, has been developing a fighting game based on it called Duelist of Eden. It was announced last year, but the planned release date is apparently this year. It's very similar to Mega Man Battle Network PvP. The gameplay looks great, with players being able to create their own decks, choose your characters, and is promised to have online rollback netcode, which... Mm. Mm. Oh, that's that good shit! Also, there are new characters being added alongside the original 7, like Jiretta. I don't know who she is, but she looks cool as fuck. With 4 new characters, the roster will be 11, which is pretty damn good for an indie fighting game. They're also planning on adding guest characters like Dreadworm from Maiden Spell and Maple from Rivals of Aether. You can apply for a beta test on their website and Steam, as well as look up gameplay from playtests on YouTube. You can wishlist the game on Steam, and they also have a Twitter where they actively talk about the game and show clips of it. I really hope this game gets popular, as I would love to see some esports on this thing. I think it would be really interesting to look at. Anyway, that'll be all I can explain for One Step from Eden, a brilliant high octane roguelike, and you can tell it was fun for the developer to make. I hope I've convinced you to at least try it out. I get how it's not for everyone as it's extremely fast paced and difficult, but if you're interested in that genre then I definitely recommend it. Especially if you're into roguelikes. I want to thank Thomas himself for the time he used to make this game, and I hope Duelist of Eden and any other future projects he makes turns out just as well, if not better than One Step from Eden. If you enjoyed this video then please consider subscribing or liking this video. If you didn't enjoy it, leave some comments below on how I can improve as this is the first time I've ever tried a video essay type format. I do plan on doing more of this type of content on stuff I enjoy, but don't get enough love. So, if you're interested in that, I hope you enjoy what I make in the future. Signing off.